Legislative uh, discussion uh, moderated by Greg Knapp, who will introduce here in just a half a second, a way to kind of maybe uh, digest a little bit of the many things that we've heard. The final opportunity for you to ask those hard questions that we've been encouraging you guys to ask throughout the day. Um, so, Greg will be moderating, but please let this panel have it uh, made up. They'll introduce themselves here in just a half a second. Like, uh, people from KPI, the Freedom Foundation, as well as some state legislators. And with that, I'll introduce uh, Mr. Greg Knapp. He is the morning host of the uh, 710 AM radio show on KCMO here in Kansas City. He'll be able to tell you just a little bit more about himself, and then uh, we'll move forward with the program. So thank you all very, very much, and uh, Greg Knapp. Thanks, I appreciate having the opportunity to be here today. Um, as, as you just heard, I'm at KCMO, 5 to 9 in the morning on 710, and uh, Kansas Policy Institute was kind enough to ask if I wanted to moderate this, and I'm very glad to do it. I'll keep it very short about me. The, the part that I think is relevant to today is I just moved here from Jacksonville, Florida, and the number one thing that my wife and I looked at to, to decide where we were going to live was schools. Of course, isn't that what everybody looks at? Even if you don't have kids, you care about how the school district is because it seems to have a lot to do with what kind of neighborhood you live in, too, and uh, what kind of economy your neighborhood becomes, because people don't like to move their employees to a place that doesn't have good schools, because people don't want to live there. And uh, one of the reasons I didn't go to some place uh, like, say, Kansas City proper, I didn't want to have to pay for my kids in private schools, in addition to an earnings income tax. So uh, if you're talking about trying to grow your economy, too, I think it's extremely important. My wife is already a teacher here at Kansas, actually. She was very blessed to get a job uh, just before school started. She teaches first grade in the Blue Valley School District, so I'm already getting a pretty good idea of what's going on in the district. And the good news is, uh, I think you guys have some really good schools here, and of course, the bad news is being close to the best is not still as good as we want to be, especially when we're talking about some of these scores, even th on things as reading, as you guys have been talking about today, 47% of the best state, Massachusetts, 47% of the fourth graders are reading at grade level. Wow, that's not great. So you want to be high that. So I'm excited about being a part of this. Before we introduce the panel, uh, Senator Brownback, excuse me, Governor Brownback was going to be here today. Unfortunately, he said he could not make it. Uh, the schedule made it so he could not make it here today. So they sent us a letter from Governor Brownback's office and they asked if we could uh, read it today so you guys know what, what his values are and why. He thinks this is important. He says, he says that he has uh, five primary goals in his roadmap for Kansas, and part of it is related to education and some of the highlights here, to ensure students who pass the fourth grade read at grade level, to limit professional liability for teachers, to open up Kansas schools to programs that provide dollars and opportunities to expand our education framework, to promote innovation in education, such as virtual learning and alternative teacher certification programs, so in preparation of the 2012 legislative session, I have begun work to prepare a comprehensive education policy package that reflects these priorities and commitments. That work has included an in-depth review of innovative policies from other states, some of which we'll be discussing here today. Moving forward, my top priority in education reform is to increase the level of achievement by Kansas students. However, we must also maximize the use of our resources. A modern funding formula should have the following features. It should increase local control and flexibility. It should be sustainable. It should be transparent and easily understandable. It should emphasize student achievement, accountability, innovation, and excellence. Crafting an education policy that both increases student achievement and maximizes the use of our resources across the broad spectrum of Kansas school districts is a significant challenge. However, it is a challenge that must be met if our state is going to grow and prosper moving forward. 
and I welcome your input and assistance. Sincerely, Sam Brownback, Governor of Kansas. So what I'd like to do to get this started, we're going to have each of the members of the panel introduce themselves and give a brief uh, one-minute statement on where they see education right now and, and what they think is the most important uh, part of that and maybe even an idea or two that they have that they'd like to put forward today. So I'll turn it over to the panel. I'm Senator, Senator Ray Merritt, and I represent the South uh, East Johnson County, and I'm a fill-in for Judith Lynn, so, or Senator Lynn, so, anyway, she's a lot better looking than I am. <laughs> but I, I served on the uh, committee uh, when we had the special session on education, and uh, <clears throat> that's some, some place I'd never want to go again, because it was a very contentious, hard, uh, hard process. I commend the, the governor for the the, uh, the things he's asking for, and I applaud him. And I would say, you know, uh, I would second what he's looking for. You know, being being up there, this is my my twelfth year. I'd like to see the education debate be a debate that takes a lot less for a time, because it's the it's one of the major things <clears throat> that we deal with every year and it's always the discussion is always uh, more money more money and accountability uh, knowing where the resources are being spent is going to be very important to me I don't think the uh, the accountability and us knowing exactly where all the money is going exists right now and I hope when we come up with a system uh, th those things will be addressed but anything, anyway, I applaud uh, the governor for his initiative. Go ahead. Hi, I'm uh, Dave Trobert, president of Kansas Policy Institute. Uh, I'll just deviate from the, the program here for just a second. I uh, wanted to have an opportunity to say thank you to uh, James Franco, who uh, our communications director, who organized this entire event, along with Jeff Reed at the Friedman Foundation, with a lot of help from Leslie Heiner. Uh, they've done a great job today, and I'd just like to give them a, a round of applause. <laughs> you know, I said this morning, uh, and asked for a show of hands, if anybody thought that about having a third of our kids read proficiently was acceptable, and, and there were no hands. And that doesn't surprise me. Uh, what surprises me is that knowing that, uh, we have, in Kansas, we have consistently uh, tried to argue against change. Knowing that we're not at an anywhere close to an acceptable level, we continue to try to find excuses. It almost reminds me of when my, I'm glad they're not here to hear me say this, but when my boys were in high school and they would come home uh, with a laundry list of excuses for why they didn't have their homework done or why they didn't do this. Well, but, yes, but, that. That's kind of the way we've approached the situation in Kansas, and frankly, a lot of states around the country. Thank goodness some are, are changing that approach. You know, if if putting if increasing uh, spending in schools by 2.5 billion dollars since 1998 doesn't move the needle, uh, it's time to stop looking for excuses and start saying why not start looking at some other things we can do. We just have to. <laughs> Uh, we have to stop that. Uh, it, it's unfortunate. Uh, you'll notice there's some uh, empty chairs here at the end of the uh, uh, panel. We invited, not just this time, we've invited other times, the, uh, uh, the organizations, uh, the school board association, the department of education, the state board of ed, superintendents association, the teachers union, to have open public discussions, as the senator suggested. We, should, we need to have this out in the open. Uh, and every time we've extended that offer, they've declined. And, and Greg has some comments he'll share with you on the reasons they gave for declining. And that's really unfortunate uh, because all we're taught, we have to face facts. Uh, you know, we, we have to stop kidding ourselves. Uh, I'll, I'll save one set of stats here for this specific purpose. It's commonly known that Kansas compares well to other states. Uh, we might not be, we might all be way below where we need to be, but we, we, we've heard a lot that we compare well. 
Let me share something with you as, as to why one of the big reasons that is. If I were to say, let's compare the test scores of a wealthy uh, school in the suburbs with a school, an inner city, poor, uh, poverty-stricken school, how many people would think that would be a fair comparison of those two schools? Nobody would think that's a fair, because we obviously we understand that these are different kids, and these kids are going to learn differently. They have different challenges. English language learning and poverty has a difference on that. And yet we don't apply that same logic when we compare how states score. Part of the reason that Kansas scores well compared to others is our demographic makeup. And I've, when I've said this before, I've been accused of playing the race card, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, if you look at the way that Kansas compares on each demographic group, you get a dramatically different picture. The fact is, in Kansas, we have 73% uh, of our students are white. There's a lot of talk about, right now, the governor is talking about changing the tax system, something along the lines of Texas. And people immediately say, well, we don't have, you know, we don't want those Texas schools. And yeah, if you compare the Texas scores, they're lower. Here's why. Texas has 34% um, white and 48% Hispanic. We have 73% white and 14% Hispanic. Florida is 47% white and 26% Hispanic and 24% black. If you look at how these individual groups each score, it's a dramatically different picture. Uh, if you just look at white students in Kansas, we have 40% of our fourth graders proficient in reading. In Texas, it's 43%. In Florida, it's 45%. If you look at Hispanics, we have 20% proficient. Texas is right behind us at 18. Florida's at 31. Look at blacks. It's a dead heat, 20, 20, and 18. Low income, Kansas is at 22. Texas is a little bit lower at 17. Florida's at 25. For the same reason we can't compare the wealthy school with the inner city school, we cannot compare states without looking at how those demographic mixes change. And I don't mean that to be negative. I don't mean that to be scary. It's just reality. Until we understand and really comprehend as a state where we are, we don't know where we need to go. And that's why we, we try to put these, this, there is no right or wrong. Our approach is there's no right or wrong. We can say, yes, there's a right or wrong on how much we're spending. How much should we spend? That's not a right or wrong. What should we spend it on? That's not a right or wrong. Those are all perspectives. And the only way you can come to a, a, a full informed decision is to have all the information. So I want to thank everybody for coming out today to hear this so that we can get more of the information that has not been uh, generally available in the public. Hello, Leslie Heiner again. Uh, you know my position on vouchers and school choice uh, generally. <laughs> I'm a pretty strong advocate, as, as you know. Uh, but now that uh, Tony Bennett has uh, spoken and you've heard the Indiana story, I'd like to share a little bit more um, the rest of the story about Indiana because I think it might be instructive for you here in Kansas. Um, in Indiana, the whole move for education reform uh, goes back a good 20 years. And in fact, there was a time in Indiana, um, along the early 90s, when we did one of the rails that Tony talked about. He talked about the two rails. Well, we did one of them and we did it exceptionally well. It was called the A-plus plan. And we did it so well that we were all patting ourselves on the back that we were the best state in the country. And sure enough, Indiana was leading the country at that time. But we forgot the second rail. We forgot the choice piece. So what happened is, over time, that first rail that we passed started getting whittled away, piece by piece. Let's pull it back just a little bit. It won't really hurt that much. Let's, you know, we need a little more money, so let's pull this back a little bit. Or, well, the teachers are unhappy, so let's pull this back a little bit until we were left with nothing, which is what compelled us this these last few years to be so aggressive because we had been down this path of thinking we were doing the right thing and we just didn't do enough. 
Now, the important thing in, in my view as to why this year it worked, whereas 20 years ago and in the years in between, um, legislators would hear the school choice terms and the voucher terms, because, you know, me and a lot of my friends, we were out saying them, and they'd run for the hills because it was kind of scary. Um, they knew that the opposition would be really tough, and sure enough, I mean, even before any kind of legislation was proposed or there was any kind of discussion, the opponents would come out real strongly and say, now you're not thinking about doing that again, are you? Um, and would be extremely threatening. Now, I can tell you that as a person who served as Chief of Staff to the Speaker of the House and as counsel to both the House and also in the Senate, um, I understand legislators really pretty well. You know, we have a citizen legislature, and so our legislators were dairy farmers, um, duck farmers, um, teachers, retirees from all walks of life. Uh, and people who frankly just aren't used to getting death threats. It's part of their normal job. Uh, one of our legislators was a hog farmer. He said, you know, I really like my hogs after a day here. <laughs> I, they're a lot easier to deal with. Um, so so it's, it's tough stuff. There's, there's just no question about it. It's very, very difficult. And for all of you who are in the room who are not legislators, I, I can't ask you enough to please support your legislators. Give them the kind of moral support that they need let them know that you're on their side. Um, it's a really tough job in the best of times. And when they're trying to do something that's difficult, it can be pretty depressing. Uh, but what really helped us this year, and I think made all the difference, is instead of saying, we're gonna do that one rail, and, and we're gonna do everything that they did in Florida, et cetera, um, and then kind of whispering about the second rail, Instead, we said, no, we're going to do the second thing. We're going to do vouchers. Oh, yeah, we'll do this other stuff. But we're going to do vouchers. And as soon as we had that conversation, it was a little startling at the state house. <coughs> the debate shifted. Well, well, you're being a little bold, aren't you? Uh-huh. Yep. Being a little bold. And at the end of session, when it really came down, you know, those last days of session, like Tony was talking about, it's when the real wheeling and dealing goes on, and the white smoke that he talked about, that's, that's really true. Uh, <laughs> I'm here to tell you. Um, we had an interesting thing happen. In Indiana, our House Democrats left the state, just as they did in Wisconsin. Our House Democrats were gone for a longer period of time. So we had lost an awful lot of bills. Um, but the charter school bill had made it out of the House and over to the Senate before they left. The voucher bill did not, one of the bills that died. So as we were looking at the, the narrow quantity of bills that were sitting over there in the Senate where we could put legislative language into, the charter school bill, um, and under our constitutional restraints, was a, person, a, a perfect bill where we could put the language the voucher language in and marry this in the Supreme Court, but I think that was just fine. Um, so it was my job to go to the charter school folks and say, you know, we need to have a conversation about marrying these bills. And took a big step back, so oh, now that's, you know, we've been friends for a long time. We've been friends for 20 years here and working on this, but I don't want to lose that charter school bill. I said, well, here's the thing. Governor Daniels has been real plain about this. If we don't do the voucher, we're not doing anything. If you want your charter school bill, then you could ask me nicely if we'd be willing to put our voucher bill into the charter school bill. That conversation was also transformational. Suddenly, the clarity of the argument that no, we're not going to go through the same thing that we went through 20 years ago where we tried hard, we did our best, it was really great, and then 20 years later we had failed. We're not doing that again. We're going to do both 
rails. This is an all or nothing proposition to be really successful. It takes an awful lot of courage for legislators to cross over that bridge. This is, this is not for sissies, let me tell you, this is tough. But it works. This is how you get it done. The piecemeal approach will just hurt you every year for as many years as you want to keep hurting yourself. Or you can do it right the first time, get it done, and then reap the benefits over time. As I used to tell uh, the legislators in my caucus, it was simply this. We're a citizen's legislature. You have a certain period of time here at the state capitol, and it's tough, and it's long hours, and you work hard, and you may get death threats back home. Your mother may get death threats. This happened. But when the session is over, it's over. <coughs> You go back, you face the music. But if you've done the right thing, the music you face will be pretty nice. So we had legislators who went from getting death threats during session to getting beautiful thank you notes from parents of children who were so eternally grateful that for the first time they had a chance that their child might really be able to be in the right place and learn and have a real future really made up for all the rest. Uh, so I, I, my personal experience with this, I just wanted to share this to you, that uh, it's worth the fight. It's a hell of a fight, but it is worth it, every minute of it. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Arlen Siegfried. I'm a representative from District 15. I'm also the House Majority Leader uh, for this term. and. Uh, this session will be my 10th year in the legislature. And I echo somewhat of what uh, Ray said earlier. I was there through the uh, school fights before. Uh, I was struck by Dr. Bennett's statement that uh, part of the problem was that the arguments over school funding and school policy were not related. That is certainly true of the state of Kansas. And to a great extent, it's still tr true of the state of Kansas. And it's something that we have to change. I'm very thankful that uh, we have one of the pieces of the puzzle in place that allowed Indiana to move forward, and that is that we now have a strong governor who is going to lead out on a school funding change. Uh, could be a little different than school reform, uh, but those of us in Johnson County are very happy to see the local control portion of this thing come to the forefront because we've been fighting that battle for a long time. I think we have a really good chance of making some advancements there as long as equity remains part of it. Obviously transparency, transparency achievement and maximum uh, results from our investment is something that we can all support. I was just want to thank <coughs> David for uh, putting this together today. This was really an interesting thing. Uh, you notice I sit on the front row. Uh, I'm easily distracted and up here nobody I don't know what people are saying about me or pointing at me from behind. Uh, I really, really uh, enjoyed this. And there were some things that stood out to me very, very plainly. This is the second time I've heard the Florida story. Uh, I am impressed that Kansas has to quickly do something about third grade reading. Uh, the truth that you have to learn to read and then read to learn is just an absolute fact. And we can't put that off for a long time. It's something that we need to deal with. Uh, our charter school laws have been ineffective for a long time. We all know it. Uh, frankly, there's been so much other stuff going on with education funding. I think everybody just avoided the rest of the things to do with school reform because uh, there is a, a level of energy in a 90-day session that you can expend on things. And uh, it was, some of these things were just a bridge too far. Uh, on the vouchers, uh, Governor Daniels took a really strong position on vouchers. I really do not know and have never heard what Governor Brownback's position on vouchers is. I can't honestly sit here and tell you. I know that he's a wonderful man and a great leader, but he has never talked to me personally about vouchers. Uh, but 
I wouldn't be surprised at all to see a proposal to have a McKay type voucher come up in the state of Kansas uh, very soon here. Uh, one of the other really, really critical things that we have to work on is joining teacher evaluation to classroom achievement like Ms. Jacobs talked about. My wife taught for 36 years and that is so critical. It's, it's much like the, the school funding, the school policy piece. Sometimes teacher evaluation is totally unrelated to the most important product, what our, what our kids are going to learn. It, it's not even part of it. And it's something that, that we have to, have to take a look at. And the other thing is uh, kind of a no-brainer, and uh, that's the online learning. We have, a, we have a piece on that, and we need to expand that rapidly. I think it may be the, keys, the, the key piece to bringing peace between the eastern part of the state on education and the western part of the state on education. Uh, because we need to really develop their ability to have uh, an array of uh, classroom products that allow them to get a great education even though they may have a very small number of students. And we can do that online. We have that capacity and we need to move quickly on that. I would say this, this will be a different strategy <coughs> in the state of Kansas because we do not have a uh, Dr. Bennett, nor do we have such a position in the state of Kansas. And he said very clearly that he did not believe the governor should be the one doing that. Well, the way we are structured, that leaves legislators to do that. And if you want 92 Republican legislators, first of all, they all have to agree on this. And that's a big question. Uh, and the second thing is they all have to agree to go out there and get beat up on this. And so this is a totally different animal than what they were talking about up here. Uh, so there's some of these things that have to be done, need to be done, and we are going to work towards doing them, but it will be a different strategy because we don't have the big baseball bat to go out and stand in front of the teachers' unions and things like that. That's, that's probably not going to take place the way we're structured right now. Thank you. And before uh, Representative Cheryl Spalding speaks, I'd like to bring in uh, Senator David Haley, too. I think I saw him just come in. Uh, there he is. And Senator Haley, feel free to come on up and, and take your seat when you have just a minute. Didn't mean to get you in mid uh, swallow there, but thanks for being here. I know you had your, your, uh, had a little trouble getting there right up. We're glad to have you. Go right ahead, uh, Representative Spalding. Appreciate it. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks everybody for coming, and I really appreciate being asked to be part of this panel. I made notes as we went along, and my trip will be to be able to read them because my chicken scratches make a doctor's uh, ability to write look pretty good. So uh, here we go. Um, first of all, I, I'm a kind of a glass half full kind of a person. So the takeaway I had from uh, what I heard earlier was the only states that do better uh, than we do on all the measures are, uh, are those three or four or five states who spend a lot more on education, so that we are already doing a lot of things very well and very efficiently. In fact, uh, KASB a number of years ago did uh, at least one or two years of samples where they looked at the difference between public and private schools here in the state of Kansas. So we could really compare Kansas students together with one another. And we looked at those commonalities with SES, so, uh, socioeconomic status. So if we matched those schools with the other schools that matched them, the public schools did as well as the private schools here in our state and sometimes did even better. And the reason we could do all those things is because Kansas, like a number of <coughs> other states mentioned today, Texas for one, was willing to jump in the deep end of the pool. We had QPA well before we had anything that looked like NCLB, No Child Left Behind. Our QPA was Quality Performance Accreditation, and it allowed us to test every school district, every school, and put those test scores out in public so everybody could see what they looked like, and that was well before we had No Child Left Behind. 
So by the time No Child Left Behind came around, we were used to the idea, and so the extra strictures that came with the federal government and their rules, we were able to incorporate in our stride. And I'm very proud of us for being able to do that. The other thing I'm very excited to mention is that we are right now, through the Department of Education, building a, an evaluation instrument that will hold teachers and principals accountable for student outcomes. In other words, it's going to include that. Uh, the KNEA, KASB, I believe, is both involved with the Department of Education, and they're looking at ways to uh, look at student achievement and make sure that that gets into the evaluation. And as mentioned before by someone else, uh, we do have the infrastructure already in place to look at individual students and trace them not back just to their district, but, by, but back to the building and back to individual teachers. So we can hold our teachers and principals accountable for student outcomes. And as the, I think one of the last speakers talked about, which talked about teacher quality, no one says that's the one and only thing that you look at. You look at all kinds of things when you look at teacher evaluation. But right now, we are looking at that, and I really do expect that to be part of our legislation this coming year. Um, let's see. Oh, we did, uh, as one of the uh, questioners mentioned, we did put in place a five-year teacher um, probation period. Right now, any school district can give teachers uh, tenure as soon as they want to, but they have the right right now to um, wait up to three years. And KNEA, frankly, was neutral on this after they found out and we put in, because the chairman of the education uh, committee said, let's work together so we can make this work for both of us. So we put in there that teachers, after the three years, cannot be fired without giving them a reason. Right now, after three years, you can let them go and they're, they're, you don't have to give them a reason. You don't like the color of your shoes or you didn't get along with the other teachers. Whatever the reason is, we don't have to give it. But according to this new rule, after three years or any time after that, if they haven't been given tenure, you do have to give them a reason. And because of that, KNEA went along with it and remained neutral on that uh, particular item. Uh, let's see. Oh, one of the suggestions today were to reward successful schools. And boy, hallelujah, when most of us in here, and I know a number of superintendents and school board members are here, we would love to have that because our schools are very successful and we'd love to be able to get rewarded for that. Politically, it might be very difficult to do um, because it'd be hard to take money out of the pot and give it to schools who are already successful and give them more money. But I do like the idea. The other one that we've touched on is, uh, the last one I'll mention, uh, is uh, teacher preparation. And I do think we need to do a better job of teacher preparation. One of the things uh, I looked at in the education committee probably two years ago was the new system that we were putting in by the Department of Education. It had to do with looking at reading programs, uh, looking at how uh, teachers were supposed to evaluate readers, not particularly label them dyslexic or anything else, but be able to solve the reading programs. And having been through some of that, I was a teacher, uh, was on the school board and so forth, but I know that a lot of these things are not dealt with adequately in our teacher prep programs. And so I asked some of the uh, colleges to come before us and talk about this. Were, do they believe they were adequately preparing teachers to work in our own state system to deal with these things? And frankly, they said, we are in the process of changing. We need to look at it. We need to make sure that they can do it. Because I believe, last time I looked, we had one special ed uh, credit that was required. And I'm not sure any special reading programs uh, particularly uh, by some of, especially the middle school and high school teachers. So that's something, again, we can look at. We can bring the uh, regents before us again and ask them how they were doing and how they were aligning the curriculum with some of the things that our own state is requiring of the teachers. So those are just a few of the things I've, I'm seeing that we're doing and some of the things I'd like to see continued with. Thank you. <laughs> I too uh, would like to thank Kansas Policy for hosting this event, this crucial time in, um, in certainly our state's history and the opportunities that we have. I'm sorry that I was not here earlier and certainly to join this uh, 
august panel and those of you that are here today i am genuinely appreciative of several of our colleagues that are here um, i live in wyandotte county uh, just north of here and i will be brief in my comments i certainly uh, having been in the legislature i think longer than anyone here this is my eight, 18th year six in the house and this is my 12th in the, in the senate and i am continue to be extremely concerned about the direction that our educational system is taking. I started with a lady in the House who then went to the Senate with me uh, named Kay O'Connor. And uh, first rep and Senator O'Connor and I uh, worked very closely to try and get the Kansas legislature to turn the corner to look at the opportunities for choice that we believe our students need to be more competitive in a global environment. Organization was called, I think, Parents in Control. And I was proud to be a co-sponsor with Representative and then Senator O'Connor to work with Parents in Control uh, to assure that we have a more competitive opportunity academically for our students. We have to rely on them. And I'm going to divert just a little bit, perhaps, from what we have heard the previous panel suggest in their opening remarks. And I, I can use this in a brief analogy. I was on my way here um, from 35, coming down 35 South, and I traveled the path many times. I knew the road. I knew the path was going to get me where I wanted to go. But there was a curve. There was a change. There's construction. It wasn't the path that I was accustomed to. It's something that had worked for everyone else, but it didn't quite work for me today because there were some roadblocks, there were some impediments. And I had to take an alternate course to be here, but it still left me behind. And I believe by way of um, an analogy, by way even of metaphor, there are traditional courses that many of our students, many of our youth are expected to take that may work for some, but uh, for many, it just won't get them there in time. And we're counting on all students, I'm counting on all students, regardless of their social or their economic background. I believe that all Kansas <coughs> students should have the opportunity to be competitive, not just in a Kansas environment, but in a global environment. I'm sure that many of us know the statistics how only a fraction of students, one out of four, ever reach their grade level in reading. I'm sure we know the percentage of how what many students are learning today during the course of the curriculum in the next three, four years will actually be outdated for them to be competitive, uh, not again with Kansas or even with America, but in a world or global economy. And we're counting on that. We all have to count on them to ensure that our, our country continues to be what I feel is the greatest country uh, that we have on the face of the planet. And if we don't begin at some point in time, not only to have the exercise that we have here, but to rely upon this legislature that we have, and as was mentioned by my colleague, um, now really should be the time with the numbers being what they are in both the Kansas House and the Kansas Senate to ensure that we have not the paper charter school uh, bill that we had in place, but a meaningful one. And it's incumbent on each of you that are here today to visit with the members of the legislature to ensure that we are able to have choice in schools across our state. I was mentioning um, that I've been an avid, um, an avid, um, I think, proponent for many years because in my school district, and though there have been some strides that have brought them uh, up and around, and it's not just in mine, but in others, I don't feel as if it's always the best option to fund what by and large has been uh, factories of failure for our students. Now, I should say that in my district, we do have the number one high school in Kansas, uh, Sumner High School. Uh, it has been ranked number one, 
Uh, and I'm very happy to see the students that are matriculating there. I feel they'll be competitive. But then I look around and I see so many hundreds, thousands, perhaps, of other students, young people, our communities, children, our future, that simply will not be able to compete in the environment. Uh, once they once they graduate. So again, I, I'm I'm pleased to be here. I don't have the solutions or the answers, but I do believe that having alternate choices and having those choices funded or assisted in part, not with what our uh, Kansas Charter School law currently is, uh, because I think that that sets benchmarks in place that many charter schools cannot meet, but with a meaningful legislation that can be crafted and passed in 2012, that we will be able to have opportunities for all students, irrespective of their social or economic standing, but for the betterment, hopefully, of all Kansans that we can all be proud of. And I'm pleased to be a part and to have been invited to join this panel and to join each of you here today. Thank you, Senator Haley. Thank you, panel. And before we get into some Q&A here, I uh, wanted to make sure that everybody realized that an invite went out from the Kansas Policy Institute to all the different teacher organizations, the KNEA, the KSBOE, the KSDOE, the KASB, the K, I mean, there's a lot of these things. And uh, the invitation went out to all of them, and here's some responses from the KNEA, Kansas National Education Association. They, they didn't like the idea of outside experts. When we met to discuss potential panel events last spring, one of my great concerns was the tendency of adopting a format to bring the outside, as she puts it in quotes, experts with particular agendas to advance. Even dueling experts from the outside was an undesirable format as we discussed the possibilities for education forums. I fear that the schedule proposed would truly take us down these roads and leave the real experts, those of us who have significant work in Kansas public education, and a deep understanding of initiatives and research across the country with only a minimal chance to try and recover from the agendas of the guests. If you'd be interested in revisiting the idea of a genuine Kansas discussion without external agendas, let's visit again. Seems kind of <laughs> weird to me. I, I thought you'd want to try and take the best from everywhere. Um, Kansas uh, Board of Education. I thought KPI understood. The board felt among several concerns any panel discussion should be Kansans talking about Kansas education. I was surprised at the invitation, given that we held two meetings. Uh, then we go to KSDOE. Thank you for the invitation to participate in the Why Not Kansas panel discussion. Unfortunately, I had two meetings already in my calendar. couldn't take care of them. The KPI response was, we welcome anyone else you would like to send from the department to participate in your absence. No one came. And again, with the case be in the uh, Kansas Supervisors of Schools open invitation to everybody and they did not want to participate and uh, I thought it was all about trying to come up with new ideas and help the children so I'm a little confused on that but maybe that's just me. Also uh, wanted to uh, get into this debate now with the, um, with the Q&A and what I'd really love is if we could keep them real short brief answers so that you guys can kind of engage in a conversation uh, and I think that would be really informative and, uh, and helpful to everybody who's here today and I, I was just jotting down some things that I heard as you all were speaking to, to try to throw into the mix and one of the things on the idea of vouchers, I just came from Florida by the way, I lived in Florida most of my life and I was there when the voucher system was going on, I talked about it a lot on the radio. Uh, one of the huge things I saw in the change was not necessarily just with the children going with the voucher, it was the other schools competing. Uh, I had superintendents come on the show that said we had to change what we were doing so we wouldn't lose students. And the schools that were rated F scrambled because they didn't want to be rated F because that's how you got a voucher. And they didn't want to lose those students because they lost funding with every student that left. And that's one of the concerns that I have. And to start with um, maybe Leslie and everybody jump in. The concerns I hear from the teachers and from listeners on vouchers is number one, it takes the quote, good students out of your school, takes the cream of the crop because those parents are the ones who care and they're the ones who take their kids out. So it makes your school even worse. And it takes money out of the public system because a lot of these vouchers go to private schools. I'd love you all's response on both of those. And how you can, how you can overcome those concerns. Oh, I'm happy to weigh in on that. Uh, <laughs> 
Well, anyone who thinks that uh, bachelors are meant to pluck the highest performing kids um, out of schools and put them someplace else uh, has never met any of those children. Um, in my experience, which now you know goes back some 20 years, um, those aren't the kids who leave. And think about it, this is a common sense thing that, that the teachers union just misses every time. If you're a parent, your kid's in school, doing well, thriving, learning, things are going great, you're not moving your child, <laughs> and your child will not want to leave. Vouchers are not attractive for parents whose children are performing at high level, those, those best students. They just aren't. Vouchers are attractive for those families and those students who need help. That's who leaves a public school is the kids who aren't learning in those schools for whatever reason. In some cases, like in Illinois, you've heard all these stories about the bullying situation, which has gone to extreme levels. They're desperate for vouchers there as a safety issue. Uh, it can simply be that maybe your child is not comfortable in one of the huge mega schools and maybe just needs a smaller environment to thrive. Or the other way, maybe your child is in one of the small schools here in Kansas. I've learned you have many small schools. But really would much prefer being in a, in a bigger, maybe more energetic school. Maybe that's a better learning environment for your child. Well, the point is, if you need help, a voucher offers you the help so your child can learn. Um, so it's not it's not ever what the teachers union portrays. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Go right sure. ahead. Um, you know, it's interesting. You're absolutely right, Greg. It, it's it's always phrased as it will. Well, if it will, it, you say it will when you can't say it does. The fact is, it doesn't. And those are very well-known facts. In the places it's been used. In the places it's been used. It's been used, it's very low uptake. It's the ones, the ones who mostly use it are special needs kids, low-income kids, the ones who need the help the most. Uh, the evidence says just the opposite. That's why it, you, when you hear it, it will always be phrased as it will, not it does. On the uh, taking the resources out of schools, um, the way, and you can devise these, whether it's tax credit scholarships or vouchers, a number of ways, but it allows uh, a portion, usually, of the state funding. Sometimes, like in Kansas, for example, it might be the base state aid per pupil, uh, around $4,000. But Kansas spends over $6,000 per pupil uh, out of the state funds towards schools. So let's say the voucher was set at four, just hypothetically. 4,000 would go with the student. The other 2,000, would, would stay with the state. The federal money and the local money stays at the public school. That doesn't go with the student. So the school loses all of the cost of educating that kid. And keep in mind, these are mostly the highest cost students to educate. It's the low income kids, it's the at risk, it's the special needs. All the cost of the kid goes away. Only a piece, maybe only a third of the revenue associated with that kid goes away. So David, if we're talking about $12,300 per Pupil in Kansas, four thousand goes with the voucher. You're saying the other eight thousand three hundred would stay in that school. Yeah, on, on average. On average, right. and they and they don't have to teach that child anymore. That's right. Which is, which is, now, what it, one other thing I want to do on the voucher before we move on, and please jump in if you have other comments on that is the rural parts of Kansas. Quite often, there's no other school for them to take that voucher to if they're way out in the countryside. Oh, what 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 happens to those students, and what can they do with that kind of situation? That's, that's where people in the community step up. Um, and that's what you see is, you know, earlier when I spoke, I challenged everybody in the room to be that person who opens a charter school, who opens a private school. Um, and in fact, that's what happens in, in rural areas. Um, and oftentimes, the um, having an online component um, is extremely attractive um, to people who are working in the fields on a regular basis. Uh, it's great for their kids to have access to somebody who knows how to to speak a foreign language. They may not have a teacher there um, who can teach some different languages or different types of math or uh, just a whole host of subjects uh, that may not be available to them in, in a small community, but they can 
they can access, they just start the school themselves, and in fact that happens. And so it's a great opportunity for, uh, for local folks in the rural communities. Again, um, you know, school choice becomes just a tool that people can use in their own communities to tailor it to whatever your needs are. Um, and Greg, I, I can't let this funding issue go without, um, without sharing something from the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which is not normally known for pithy quotes, um, but <coughs> this year ago, there was a great line in the Wynn case, it's W-I-N-N, went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, that was the Arizona case where the tax credit scholarship program was challenged. And in the court's opinion, that was written by Justice Kennedy, by the way, who is not known as one of the conservatives, he's clearly the swing vote on the court, uh, but he wrote that if you are a person who believes the opposite side of this argument, which is to say that the Thatcher's tax credit scholarships are unconstitutional or should be or takes money away or whatever it is, if you're on that side, then you also have to believe that there is an entitlement to the money. And so the Supreme Court said, your private bank account does not equate with the state's treasury. The state does not own your money. Your money is your money. And no one else is really entitled to it. Um, and that showed up in the US Supreme Court decision. So when I read that decision uh, <laughs> this summer, I thought, Wow, this is a little bit of a departure from you know normal legalistic kind of language, um, and it came from Kennedy. Um, but then it also was a little concerning to me that they felt the need to write that into that Supreme Court decision to make it real clear to everybody: no one has an entitlement to your tax dollars. If you are serving a child, you should be paid for serving a child. If you are not serving a child, you don't get to keep the money. That's it. It's a service issue. Senator Merrick, I think, wanted to jump on this too. Yeah, I'm going to uh, kind of digress here. Uh, your comments from the people that didn't show up here today, I just wish the public out there could have heard the excuses. You know, I, I personally uh, am offended, but I'm not surprised because that's what we deal with every year being legislators. Let's not hear from the outside world. We got all the answers. This group's got all the answers. The people that don't, don't want to be here. And I mean, it's been that way since I've been, been in the legislature, and it's sad. You know, they're not willing to open up and say, oh, there's other ideas out there. They might be better than what we're doing right now. I want us to get back to the, the point in time where the kids in the schools, Johnny can't read. The kids in the schools are the concern of where the money ought to go. I don't care about all these outside groups. They don't want to come along. Hey, you haven't come along all these years, so you know, you're, you're not enemy to me. But if Johnny can't read, we got a problem. And I had a, a you know, I, my kids went to one of the best school districts in the state. And I, I, it's a crying shame that we, 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 you know, move people on if they can't read, because that's the basis to everything. And it's time that we get back to the situation where we're concerned about the kids in the schools. Not how much money the school districts are getting, <coughs> But what are we doing for the kids? And that's what where, that's where our concerns ought to be. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead Senator Haley. Just briefly to, uh, to, your, to your question. Um, I'm a product of, of, of public education. And I um, came up in the school system. And, uh, the difference um, in many times was my parents' commitment to me. Education was not just uh, in school, uh, but also it was after school, it was year-round as well. And so often we don't have that commitment. So I, I do, I, I don't want this to be constrained for me to defund public education. That is not 
uh, certainly my intent. I do think that uh, if there can be a partnership uh, between children and, and their parents, that that can work well. I'm, I'm involved with an organization called the Black Alliance for Educational Options, B-A-E-O, and the website, by the way, is baeo.org. And there were some studies done in Milwaukee that had, and also in Washington, uh, where they had both charter school and voucher opportunities, and proved consistently that supporting charter schools and supporting vouchers did not be fun public education. This is one of the concerns I've had, and some of the argument that we hear from some of the unions especially is that by doing that, well, it hasn't proven to be true in two places that have had successes in providing for that. And I like to, to kind of point that out as often as we can. Now, do charter schools or do vouchers call the cream of the crop? Um, I would have to certainly concur with that, I mean, the, the cream of the crop, if they're doing well in one environment, you won't need to look for other options. And so by and large, it does not stand to reason that that would be the case. And so as we listen to some of these arguments, these hollow, futile arguments, it really does beg the question um, where the powerful lobbies lie and whose side they really are. And when the chickens come back home to roost, in subsequent generations, and we don't have a workforce that is academically prepared to meet the needs of our growing society in a decade or in a generation to come, then these advocates or unions who have brought these hollow arguments will too have to bear the brunt of how our society as a whole deals with some of the residual problems. In closing, uh, on this point, you know, I was at a, a seminar a couple, a couple months ago, and the statistics were brought out that many states are looking at building prisons based on the performance of census tracts uh, in school, for students in school. In other words, the projection for what the need will be for prison space is based on how well uh, the performance is academically of students. To me, that's deplorable. It, it really is, and it's sad. And we've got to change that matrix. We should have changed it long ago, but it has to be done immediately so that we don't sacrifice uh, for another generation being a second class uh, citizen, or worse, being incarcerated simply because they weren't given an opportunity to be academically prepared. Senator, you had one last thing you want to say? Yeah, one, one of the questions was uh, the rural schools. And, uh, you know, we, we have a, a thing in the state called Can Ed. And we put a tremendous amount of money in it every year. It was supposed to be self funding by now, but it, like everything else in government, it never quite gets there. But we put a lot of money in it. You know, rural schools, they do have opportunities uh, to plug into. Johnson, uh, Johnson County Schools or whatever uh, to get some of those courses they can't uh, can't afford to have a teacher or whatever out uh, out in the rural area. So there is a a thing they can they can do they they can have access to. Thank you. Very nice. I think I have a question back here. Go right ahead, sir. Well, thank you, uh, panel and Senator Haley. Kind of set up a lot of the uh, aspects of my question, which is there's been a lot of, I don't want to say bashing, but criticism of the teachers unions today as an impediment to many of the types of reforms that we've all talked about today. And I think that reformers and conservatives who want these reforms, they always say, well, we're not criticizing the teachers, we're criticizing the union. But I'd like to point out that the union leaders are teachers, in which time, big districts, I think they take leave off of teaching to do their union duties. And then again, the teachers elect these leaders as well. So have we come to a point, or should we start to work, I mean, realize that it's the teachers that are electing these union leaders. They've got the union leaders that, that they want, that are pursuing the policies that benefit them to the detriment, I think as Senator Haley pointed out, that to the detriment of the school children. So should we start trying to hold teachers accountable to some extent, and then also the administrators that uh, tolerate and accommodate the unions and also the legislators that accept their campaign contributions and parrot their talking points. Um, 
Bob, that's a great question, and, and it, it reminds me of something I meant to mention earlier, uh, and, and it's, it's perfectly germane here. Um, we have to be careful when we talk about organizations or groups of people that it, they don't speak for all of their members. Uh, I was remiss earlier when I mentioned that, that some of these organizations were invited and weren't here. I wanted to point out, and I'm glad you gave me this opportunity, that some of the individuals within those organizations, such as one of the members of the State, state School Board Association, is here. Uh, two members of the State Board of Education are here. Uh, there are individuals within those organizations, and I'm sure a great many teachers, who disagree. In fact, there's another organization here, the Association of American Educators, um, which is a growing organization, professional organization for teachers who don't want to be in a union. Uh, so it's, we have to be careful not to uh, categorize everybody as having the same uh, positions. Uh, they have, there, there are people within those organizations that themselves may have completely differing views. Uh, and I'm real pleased to see a number of those people here today. Uh, and I, I think that there are uh, a lot of people within teachers' union, there's probably a lot of teachers who don't agree with uh, the, uh, the methodologies or the beliefs or whatever within the union. Go right ahead. Uh, thanks for the question, Bob. I, I have a little different perspective on it. My wife taught for 36 years. And about, uh, oh, halfway through her career, she left the KNEA uh, because she did not approve their policies. And uh, many of her uh, co-teachers, and my wife's retired now, followed that same path. So there is not universal support for the KNEA. Uh, many teachers do not agree with them on a lot of issues and have chosen to withdraw their support and go to other organizations to get their the insurance that they carry and things like that. Uh, we have a lot of support among teachers for our positions in many areas and I would not want to cause problems with that group of people uh, who coexist inside the schools. Uh, I think that the KNEA is very outspoken uh, at the Topeka level, and but I'm not sure they're all powerful, Bob. But I, I would point out another thing that bothers me a lot more. Uh, I supervised and managed uh, union people for many years. I understand what unions do. I don't agree with it, but I understand. But the Kansas Association of School Boards, which testifies off the same letterhead that they do, bothers me greatly. And I have recommended to my own school board that they withdraw from that organization. Uh, I think at one time the Shawnee Mission School District did for a period of time. Uh, but this is a group of people that should be offering a counter argument to the KNEA. And instead, they, I tell you, when they come in to talk, they talk off the same letterhead. And they testify exactly the same. And that's a problem. That's a problem. One is representing labor, the other is representing management. Uh, and so we're out of balance there. And that troubles me a great deal. Because the Kansas Association of School Boards is totally responsible for running quality schools in the state of Kansas. And is totally responsible for having quality outcomes in the classroom for our students. And I think there were digging on their responsibility at this time. And I wanted to uh, ask Representative Spaulding this one, because when you, in your opening statement, you talked about judging the teachers on, on their performance, and I love that idea, and one of the problems I saw with No Child Left Behind is they were judging schools based on test scores only. And to me, if a, if a teacher gets a group of kids who are scoring at 30%, and she moves them to 50%, She's done a much better job than somebody that got kids at 85% and moved them to 87. So what can we do to try to reward the teachers for the improvement that they brought to the students they got at the beginning of the year? I believe that's exactly, it's a great question, and I believe that's exactly what the KNA, KESB, Department of Ed, that group is looking at. What is fair? Because you can't expect everybody to look at test scores at the end and say all oh, yours are in the 97th and yours are in the 54th when the one in the 54th may have made more progress over the year. So I think they're going to be looking at the growth model mentioned earlier by one of the uh, groups that talked about the growth model and, and uh, 
looking at teacher evaluation. I think that's probably going to be part of the mix. So I expect that to be. Yeah, good question. Okay, ma'am, you have a question? My question is actually redirection back to the voucher issue. Um, most, most of those in the room know that I am firmly on the side of innovation in education uh, and however we need to go about in doing so. I did, I did want some clarification on, on the funding mechanism. If, if we're saying that we're going to take the base state aid and, and put that into a voucher system, however we go about doing that. But then Dave, Dave specifically said that uh, the 2000 would remain with the school district as well as the local property taxes. My question is, how, how can that be when the local school funding is based upon the full-time students taken at a specific date at the beginning of the year? And so how can that 2000 remain with the, the school and how can the local, or is that basically the savings and money going to go back into the funding formula? Uh, it, if I said school, I misspoke. It's the, the, two, the extra money, whatever, however you set it up, whether it's a fixed dollar amount or percentage, anything extra would stay with the state. So what you were doing, what you're doing is saying, yeah, because you would still fund schools if you use that model, you would still fund schools, assuming today's formula, based on how many kids they have there. So the, but what would be different would be the $4,000 to pick that number, and that's all I'm doing and saying that follows the kid who chooses to voucher or the tax credit scholarship. Uh, that's all that goes away. So if I'm a school district that lost that kid, um, that all the cost of that kid goes away. Um, now the, the district would lose the, the, the district would lose the state money because they don't have they don't have the kid. They're not going to have any of the weightings. The state would have the rest of that money. And what, what they choose to do with that would be part of the, the legislative uh, rules that would be written up. The district would still get the federal funding and the local funding because that's not based on per pupil. That's based on geography. Okay, thank you. I, you did say with the school, so I, that's why I wanted to clarify. Okay. Because I think we can't, make, we can't make good decisions. We can't think about these in, in the real policy uh, implications if we don't have the absolute correct data. So thank you for clarifying that. Great question. Um, if I may, on the school funding formula also, uh, you'll find across the country um, school funding formulas <laughs> are similar, uh, but inevitably in each state there's something a little bit quirky about the school funding formula. Um, so with respect to um, the data and the facts, there's no hard and fast rule that this is the way you do a voucher and it has to be this way. Um, there is a way that marries, as, as Tony was talking to us about, there's a way that you marry your education policy and your school funding formula, the policy and the fiscal together, um, and a voucher allows that. You'll find that uh, vouchers across the country are, are different in, in odd ways, but it suits their school funding formula and their methods in their state. And you do the same thing here as well. Uh, particularly, if the governor is looking at uh, taking a look at your school funding formula, um, this is a perfect opportunity uh, right now to make sure that you're having these conversations in structuring something that <coughs> gives you the maximum flexibility to do whatever it is you want to do. Um, and, and again, it'll be unique to Kansas, uh, but. But these conversations with the really smart fiscal guys um, who, I don't know, I just couldn't live without them. They, they can walk their way through these school funding formulas like, you know, eating ice cream. And, and for me, who's not a fiscal person, it's hard. Uh, but I do know that marrying the two um, is, is doable, it works, and it can suit your purposes here. Yes, sir, go right ahead. I'd just like to uh, comment on uh, something Senator Merrick said at the beginning when he talked about how much, really an important amount of time is being spent in discussing education issues in Eastern your, your tenure. And thinking about that, I would, first of all, I really appreciate this day. It's been very informative and outstanding people that came out from out of town to, to help us in frame these issues we're talking about regular, uh, educational reform. Uh, I, and I also feel uh, I'm very, uh, appreciative of all the legislators, not only on the panel, but out here, that came to spend a day, when as much time as they spent over there anyway, but came to spend a day talking about this issue and learning about this issue. 
I'm a little disappointed that maybe more of the legislators, that particularly that might be have some voice in education issues, that within reason, region, this region couldn't be here because I think it's important. I'd almost, Dave almost suggests this would be a great idea for, for individuals up there to consider bringing a similar kind of session to the legislator body and the legislative body in general. I think it'd be very informative. You might save a lot of time in your education discussions uh, in this next session or in subsequent sessions if, if you had a day like this to, to kind of drag out the issues that you'd be, that you'd be talking about. Secondly, uh, I, was, I also, uh, I'm, I guess I'm an early childhood advocate, and the content, the, the comment that uh, fourth grade, third grade emphasis on reading, I think is really important. I also think zero to three early childhood content uh, education is, is also extremely important. So I know some school districts are starting new programs in that. I know. Uh, uh, Senator, you're, you're in Wyandotte County, there's the Children's Campus of Kansas City, which is extremely strong and, and thinking out of the box some new initiatives in early childhood. There's, I think if we can get kids prepared as best we can to learn to read and enter in kindergarten, then by the time they are in third or fourth, we might not be looking at facing having to repeat third grade. It's, it's really, it starts at home, we know that, but there should be some things we could do on the early childhood side. I know that Blue Valley just started a uh, a significant program for early childhood. I just, I, I was curious if anybody had any thoughts on the early childhood component that, that ties into the region. Mm -hmm. Right, Thank you. Um, you know, I can't stress enough how much I agree with you about early childhood, and I think any of us who've spent any time in education issues know that that is uh, one of the most important places you can put your money. In fact, I think our legislature, uh, legislature has kept the spending for early childhood pretty uh, pretty sound because we know that even as we've reduced money for K-12, we've, we've kept the money there. And I recently uh, read in the state legislature magazine uh, that most of the states are keeping those preschool uh, years, uh, the preschool years sound as far as money goes and even putting a little more into them because you're absolutely right. By the time they get to third grade, what you said is correct. We've been hearing it for years. They've been building prisons based on the ability to read by third grade. If they can't read by third or fourth grade, then they know those kids are probably going to have a, a place and uh, cost the state a whole lot more money later on if we haven't gotten them to read. So we do need to put money into uh, uh, reading programs early on. And I appreciate that comment. You know, I had a question about um, mainstreaming some of the special ed students. Um, I think there's some great things about that. I think there's some negatives too, and I'd love your thoughts on this. That I know of one particular teacher that has four special needs kids in her class in elementary school, and she does have a pair or two that comes in to help, but it makes it extremely difficult for her. She has to slow down the entire class for those four students. So the other children who are in that class now are not getting the same education that the other children are in the other classes in that grade book. They're not moving along at the same speed. She just can't do it. Uh, in fact, I've seen her in tears over it. She wants to help those kids who are in special needs. But how do you do that and keep those other kids up to speed? Well, what are your thoughts, panel, on the idea of that mainstreaming and how to handle that? Um, in Oklahoma, um, they uh, have a voucher for children with special needs that they passed two years ago. And uh, as a result of that, um, much like I talked about how in rural areas people will start schools, well, well the same sort of thing is happening in Oklahoma. There's a, uh, a university and a hospital um, and a and business, and they're getting together to open up a school that is specifically for children with autism. Uh, because what they found is that now that the parents of children with special needs, now that they have this voucher available to them, they have some options, um, now they have felt empowered to speak up about that and to say what they want for their children. So. Prior to today, as I understand it, um, parents just didn't really voice their concerns about um, mainstreaming those who didn't want their kids to be mainstreamed. 
I just didn't seem politically correct and nobody really wanted to listen to them and, and why bother anyway if there's nothing to be done about it. Uh, but now that there is something to be done about it, now these parents have stepped forward and said, hey, we really need this, will you help us? Um, and, it's, um, and it's a great service to those parents who have made the decision that they don't, that they don't want their children to be mainstream. Uh, so from what I've seen across the country, it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, you'll find some places like, like in my charter school, we love the kids with special needs. And, you know, the more the better. Um, and we just have that kind of environment in the school. And so we're getting a lot more kids who are coming to us who have special needs because it just seems to work at, at my school. We've embraced them. Um, but it's not that way for all kids. So again, it's this, uh, it's the point that, um, that we need those options because kids with special needs are as different as kids without special needs. I, I just wanted to say that I first heard about this from my uh, wife long before I was in the legislature as a teacher, and uh, it does create some difficulties for classroom teachers. There's no question about it. Uh, when you have a, uh, certain special needs children that are shouting out in the middle of lessons and things of this nature, even when they have a para there, uh, the idea that it doesn't uh, distract the other children in the room that's really a fantasy. But I spoke earlier about the, the uh, chances of a McKay type scholarship or voucher uh, coming out of the legislature. And the point of that is to enhance education for these children and their families by giving them options that they can take a look at. And uh, we, we have to study a lot of things as to whether that will require more than just the base state aid uh, that we offer, but we know this, legally we have to educate those children. And what we need to do is decide what is the best option for those children. And it's going to take some courage because it is going to be a, uh, an issue that will be strongly opposed by some people we just talked about. Uh, and uh, we'll have to uh, give some very reasoned arguments and data if we're to be successful there, but I think it, I think it is something that we have to pursue, uh, and I believe that if the time has come that we can't wait much longer to face these issues. So I think you're going to see some movement on that. You notice I don't want to use the word success on that, uh, but I think you will see some uh, some efforts to pass that type of legislation. Uh, and at this point in time, I think we have. Uh, a good situation in the House to work on something like this. Uh, we would get a lot of support for it over there, and uh, I'm excited about seeing it come up because I think it makes sense to do this, not only from a financial standpoint, but also to benefit the special needs children and their families at this point in time. And by the way, when you talk about autism, I think the state of Kansas is getting ready to try very hard to pass legislation to support autistic children way before school, uh, to get them the type of treatment they need at two and three years of age, to greatly reduce the effects of that disease on them, uh, because with the proper treatment, a, a large percentage of aut autistic children, the statistics tell us, <coughs> can be uh, mainstream and in an almost unnoticeable fashion. And that's something that will pay us dividends in the future when those children are adults and their parents pass on, they will not have to be institutionalized. Uh, they will be out on their own uh, taking care of themselves. And that is an extremely important policy that we'll be looking at this, uh, this session also. I think we've got time for one last question. Yes, sir, go right ahead. Uh, I think my, my question kind of goes along uh, the lines of the special needs students a little bit as well, but more specifically on the alternative education side. When it comes to vouchers, how do, how do vouchers work with alternative education students? Uh, to my knowledge, I, can't, I don't know the exact amount. Uh, there's, in addition to the regular amount of state funding that a student is, I guess, applied to a student, there's an additional amount for children that are labeled alternative ed students that goes to the schools. 
Um, I know from previous work that I did in Arkansas uh, that it was pretty rampant in the state for a period of time where uh, <clears throat> the schools uh, would label children alternative ed students. They would get the additional money for those students, but the money would not follow the student. In other words, it would go to the school and uh, the school was supposed to be using that money as it, because it costs more to educate the alternative ed students, just like it costs more to educate uh, special needs students. So when it comes to vouchers, does that money also follow the student? Because even if they choose to go to a different school, uh, theoretically it would still cost more to educate that child. If that's what you need, then that's what you can do. Uh, that's what the voucher allows. Um, I, I can tell you personally in my charter school we, we had a lot of kids who came to us as, uh, as a place of last resort um, and, and we were not the right school for them. We were desperate, uh, and this is where the charter school community can come in and really be very helpful, we were desperate for a voucher bill to pass um, because once you hit the last school, the last school of last resort, there's nowhere else for these kids to go. Um, it is an absolutely devastating position for, uh, for people in the charter school community to, to just not know what to do. Uh, we partnered with, um, with a provider uh, that worked with Salvation Army um, a great deal. I mean, we tried all kinds of community resources uh, to help these kids. But now that we have the voucher program uh, in Indiana, I'm certain that there will be the charter school community will embrace the voucher program. So when kids come and that charter school is still not the right school, uh, that there will be an alternative there. And the, and the people in the community, and this is what's happening. So then people in the community reach out to each other and say, hey, you know, here's our situation, here's this kid, we've got to find a way to help this person. Um, and, and that's what happens. So again, if you're going to be writing that law here in Kansas, you can certainly tailor it to, to address those needs. And, and I would highly recommend that you do. Uh, and Dave wanted to ask Representative Spaulding one last question. Right for him. Sure. Um, I just, um, if I missed it, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, in your opening remarks, Representative, uh, you said something about the the only thing, the only real difference between the states that were performing better in Kansas was that they spent more. That's what I have seen charts of. That the the amount of money that they have per pupil is more in those four other states. In fact, Massachusetts spends about twice what we do, as far as the charts I've seen. Uh, the uh, is, I don't know if you were here this morning. Uh, Florida, uh, for example, if Kansas spent at Florida's per pupil level, uh, we would have spent four billion dollars less over the last ten years. Certainly, there are some districts that might spend more money, but there is absolutely no evidence that spending more money uh, translates into achievement. And in fact, Kansas has seen. Uh, we've seen dramatic two and a half billion dollars more go in, and we've not seen our achievement levels change. It's it's the uh, there there are certainly some that spend more, but there's been no evidence presented today here or anywhere else I've seen. Now I I do know that for example when uh, when this first came up in the session that uh, the Kansas Association of School Boards tried to claim that. Florida did it because they spent more, and the way they tortured the numbers was to say that Florida's percentage increase in spending was greater than Kansas's percentage increase in spending, uh, disregarding totally the amount they were actually spending. One other comment: uh, the um, since these we're talking about vouchers, they uh, you know we love local control. Uh, in Kansas, and, and, and that's a good thing. So maybe just a, a tip uh, for legislators, if you're going to float a voucher bill or a charter school, maybe you label it the expanding local control bill. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate everybody on the panel. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate the time. Thank you for having me up. Thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to the Freeman.
Foundation. And thank you to all of you uh, for making the time today. We really much, uh, very much appreciate your time and the effort you made. So thank you very, very much.